Welcome to the third session of the Grace Paley Symposium. Um, I am delighted to welcome you to the film screening of Lily Rivlin's award-winning documentary film, Grace Paley Collected Shorts. We are very fortunate to have the filmmaker with us today. Do you want to just? Um, Lily Rivlin is an award-winning filmmaker, writer, and political activist. She has, uh, her journalism has appeared um, in many venues, including Ms. Newsweek and the Washington Post, and she has made a slew of documentary films, including most recently, Can You Hear Me? Israeli and Palestinian Women Fight for Peace, Give Me a Kiss, Miriam's Daughters Now, and The Tribe. Following the screening, there will be a Q&A with Lily Rivlin. Michelle Mater, who's in the back of the room, will moderate the panel. Um, Michelle is an assistant professor of media studies and film here at the New School. Uh, she has a professional background in film that spans more than 25 years. Um, she, has, she has worn many hats. She's primarily a film producer, media consultant, and Caribbean film scholar. Uh, following the, the screening and the Q&A, you're all invited to stay for a reception um, with wine and cheese and a Mediterranean platter and cookies. Um, I also invite you to visit the exhibition room in the Hirshan Suite just outside the door where we have um, a continual uh, loop of the documentary film Grace as well uh, by Sonia Friedman as well as a photography exhibit. Wow, what a wonderful, wonderful film. Thank you. Thank you. I, did, I didn't know Grace, but I think I know her now. I mean, this film just really does it. Welcome, Lily Rivlin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Could I do one shout out? I was, I was going to ask you to please introduce um, who we have in the audience. Okay. Yes. So there, there are three people who, uh, have, who were in the film who are in the audience, and I want them to stand up, but I want to say this. Every time I see this film, I am so sorry that I do not have Vera Williams' big big in letters at the beginning, and if I had the money, I would redo it, but I don't. But I'd like, Vera Williams is the illustrator, and imagine this film without Vera's illustrations. Okay, so Vera, please stand up. Yay. Yeah. And the music. The music was wonderful as well. I mean, I think that really helps carry the film and, and keeps us involved with the story. And Want to, want to hear about the music? Yeah, I'd love to. Okay, <laughs> well, I had a wonderful... Um, she came in as an intern and ended up being my right hand, Laura D'Antoni. But it, it wasn't... And, and then I had another intern. I make films with interns all the time. Fantastic. <laughs> so the other intern who came in was there when I said, what am I gonna do about the music? And she said, well, you know, I know a guy in Sarah Lawrence, and he was a student, a student, and he came in because we, we, because I have a great editor, Pola Rappaport, and um, Pola had seen a group in the subway I forgot their name already, but when I called them up, they wanted $10,000. I didn't have that. <laughs> so the student from, uh, yeah. from Sarah Lawrence came in, Kyle is his name, and um, we, we played the other music for him, and he went and did it all by himself. One person did the music. It's amazing. Amazing, It's right? a wonderful, wonderful yeah. soundtrack. <laughs> Um, well, I, I first just want to start off talking a little bit about your background, Lily, because oh. I, I saw so many similarities between you and Grace. Isn't that funny? I did, I did. Follow me. See okay. if you can follow me. <laughs> See if I'm not, you know, thinking outside the box maybe a bit. But um, I thought that you, as a filmmaker, are also a storyteller, very much, <laughs> and that um, Grace captured characters in a way that was very unique. 
um, and she used very authentic voices and frank conversations as part of her writing. And I mean, with a list of seven documentaries that are very well known and very uh, authentic in their own right, I thought that there was a lot of similarities there in terms mm -hmm. of how you approach the storytelling process. Would you agree? Well, you, you do give me chills <laughs> because uh, I, I started saying these are all parts of me. And the film that wasn't mentioned for some reason in my bio, the last one is Esther Broner. Mm -hmm. And um, Esther Broner was, I, I was part of it. So yeah, I, I make films about women that are part of me. Now, you haven't asked me, you may get to it, but I'm now working heavily on a film that is, a little, it's stretching me enormously, enormously, even though I went to it, but it's about an organizer, okay? And her name is uh, Heather Booth. Yes, <laughs> from Chicago, yes. Right, right, from yes. Chicago. And I have to work much harder on this one than uh, Grace and Esther. and Esther Broner and Can You Hear Me, Israeli and Palestinian Women Fight for Peace, because I have to learn so much about uh, all, all of the campaigns that Heather Booth mm. was involved in. So it's, it's a challenge. But isn't that why we love filmmaking? Because we're always learning something new and looking for those different right. challenges. I think, yeah, right. I mean, I think, know that's about keeps, that. I think that's what keeps me involved in the, in the filmmaking process, for sure. It's keeping me in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that there are also some questions that um, Grace asked in the film that you seem to have touched upon in your work. Um, I love when Alice Walker says that feminist writing can be subversive. It doesn't have to be right in your face that it's, you know, this is a feminist writing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that film also is, can be such a subversive form of, of storytelling or of engaging people or of getting a point across. Would you uh, I, that? I, I totally agree with that, but I, I think part of the problem is getting it seen widely. Yes. And uh, at this stage in my life, I have to say that you know, I don't know whether, I, I didn't succeed in, in most of my films getting it on television. And Heather Booth probably won't get on television either, even though she's mainstream in some ways, in some ways. So it, it depends, and yes, I, I do see myself as a storyteller. I mean, I've always felt that I was a storyteller, and I think your questions are so perceptive, and it's because you are a storyteller, obviously, so you picked up on that. But that is the wonder of, of for me, of making films, that uh, it's a story. I'm interested in telling people stories, especially women. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I think that, unfortunately, the reason that, you know, you probably haven't received the kind of um, uh, broad-based audiences for your work that you would like is because we don't have those kinds of access to networks still to this day. And that's why I sort of moved from the, the filmmaking side to the <coughs> programming and exhibition side, and that's more where I focus uh. now, because just, just because of that. Hmm. Because I found working with Women Make Movies for many years that you know, we have these amazing stories about women that do not have the kind of um, networks and get the kind of visibility that right. they they are. And what can we do about of. it? Well, we we keep I working at you. it. We, <laughs> no, we we definitely keep working at it. And I think that your body of work now is is so rich that it definitely warrants it. So we we have to work on it. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I definitely want to make this interactive, so I hope people so, have questions. So uh, the other two people who are here is oh, yes, please. B, B. Kreloff in the back. B. It, it, yes. Well, we can get a microphone to you. We can you. get, yes. and, and, and Leora, Leora can stand up. So you can stand up. <laughs> Leora, yes. Come on, Skulkin Smith. And B. Kreloff in the back, and... Uh, do I have anybody else here? We said Vera. Vera? Yes. Oh, Vera, Vera, Vera. So you should stand up because you're in it. Yeah. But Vera, without your 
illustrations I could not have done. And I have to say it over and over because even when we had the illustrations, we needed more. We needed more. And so she drew according to our needs. And that is exceptional, that is exceptional. high posterity, uh, that uh, uh, a fair number of those illustrations uh, before the ones that I had to add um, were done for a, a little book that was originally the War Resisters League calendar. Um, it was called uh, 365 Days no Ways Not to Have Another War. Wow. And I had done that uh, with... Uh, Grace did the writing, and uh, every now and then she would describe a piece to me, or she would say, I'm thinking of doing, or she would give me a piece to read, and I would make uh, uh, something that that called forth in me, which was the illustration for it. And then I made a number of things for it, that w for the calendar that were also decorative and uh, graphically inspired in order to, in order to make it a, uh, a whole together book. Uh, then that was published by the Feminist Press, and uh, it needed more pictures, but they didn't have any money for color reproduction for any more, so I did a number of black and white pictures. Grace wrote some more pieces, or drew more pieces from what she had, and I did some black and white ones, mm -hmm. and uh, we used some of those, I, I think, uh, very well. I mean, I, <laughs> I've seen this a few times, you know, and of course I'm really <laughs> glad to see my pictures in it, but uh, I was struck this time, and I, I, I think most people would agree that they're, they're very well integrated, and they really work. Mm -hmm. you know. I, I think, you know, you, you didn't say, but it, at first, didn't they come a little bit from the problem of Grace is going to stand there and read? <laughs> right? Now, Grace has a wonderful face, but that's what we'll see, and very expressive, but that's what we'll see through the whole movie. And this, uh, this helped that the way the music does. Enormously. Mm -hmm. yeah. Enormously. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, and, I, I uh, and actually, it was fun to have to do some more. Like, to order. Uh, Made like, to order. Yeah. <laughs> called yeah. up. I love the one with the broom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was... You know, it's very nice to have to do some pictures. I mean, you think you always want to do what you want to do, but as an illustrator, you have to do what the text calls for, what people ask you to do. I noticed, you know, I, there are some of my posters in there too. And uh, that uh, gets you to uh, do something you wouldn't otherwise do. Mm -hmm. It, it <laughs> calls you. other things forth. Anyway, and then, of course, oh, I just have to thank you. I mean, you can see this again and again, but uh, the. Grace was a dear friend. She was also a mentor. Uh, and seeing her again, you just, uh, you chose a person who was really a gift to the world. And, you know, to put in this its movie, and thank, thank goodness you did. Mm -hmm. Right? Thank you. Thank you. And, Absolutely. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful. You'd think it would be heartbreaking, because she's been gone a while now, but it's really, it just swells your heart to see her again, doesn't it? Yes. It just swells your heart to see her and hear her. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Vera. Um, that is something I actually wanted to talk about as well, is how you structured the film. I love how you structured the mm -hmm. film, because there seemed to be so much material on Grace that it must have been difficult to figure out what to include and what to leave on the editing room floor, so to speak, which we don't do anymore, of course, <laughs> but um, that concept and so structuring it around her short stories I thought that was really quite brilliant oh thank you well um, I watched this and I thought I hope it's not too long for everybody because this is all. oh I'm so because this is 74 minutes so it's the longest film that I've made but I had a dream I really dreamt this and I woke up in the morning and I said this has to be collected shorts because that's the the volume is called Collected Short Stories of Grace Paley. And, and I had an editor who refused, refused to, to do it that way. And so I moved out. And, 
thank goodness. And so th that's how it came. This was really inspired. And I, I took a note uh, while watching this, because I still get a thrill watching this film. And I th there's a word in Yiddish called bashert. When, when things come together. And I feel, as watching this so many years later, everything came together, including Vera drawing what we needed and the music. I mean, I have chills, and when I have chills, it all, always means truth. And uh, this was a film that was meant to be made. And I, I was channeling, I think I was channeling. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Did an amazing job. And we want to speak with other people involved with the film as well, right? Well, I love the film. Lily, it was a pleasure to sit through it again. <laughs> and I forgot how really good it was and how it does evoke grace mm -hmm. in all those phases, all those times. And I, I miss her a lot because it was a weekly conversation. I hope put, put the mic near you. I'm sorry. I hope there is a way to get it on television. I, geez, I wish I had another 10 years. <laughs> and I really mean that because I could see ways of connections that I might be able to do. I'm going to try again. Mm, okay. I. It should go on television. It Absolutely. really should. It's a. There's nobody like her, and there's never going to be any again of anybody like her. She was the most special person, and I have a lot of special people in my <laughs> life. <laughs> and I feel like, God, we got to get this out there. <laughs> I'm going to see what I can do. Okay. I'll just try again. Getting on the phone is not so hard. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank I you, B. I loved it, Lily. Thank just you. Just loved it. Maybe for your 90th birthday, you could make this happen on television. I'm going to try. Okay. I'm going to connect. I don't have a copy of it. i got to get I'll a get, copy from you. I, I'll get you a copy. That we can handle. Oh, by <laughs> the way, I do have DVDs for sale. I have to remember yes. that. So I have them with me. Excellent. <laughs> it's great. And I'll give you a check. <laughs> um, somebody else from the film wanted to say? Yes, thank you, B. Yes. Wait, 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 wait. Come, Terry. Um, <laughs> Terry's going to come across. <laughs> thank you. OK, hi. And I love the film, too. And I love working with Lily. She made me feel just super. And I was coming from a lot of tributes that upset me, I have to say, to, in all honesty, very, very much, because they didn't capture Grace and they tended to idealize her and they tended to change her into some kind of political icon. And I knew her as this warm arm and mother. I knew her, I'm 63, so I've known her since I was 22. She published my first novel. And I knew the literary Grace, so I really enjoyed knowing the other parts of her. You know, because I was very focused on the literary grace. And, and um, again, it's just in terms of mourning. And I, I, I mean, I can't believe she's not here. I just can't believe it. That's all. A fantastic film. Thanks. Thank you. That was, it is. <laughs> um, there were some other quotes from the film I just wanted to, to mention and see how you responded to. Um, there was a quote, I can't remember who said it now, but. Um, uh, in terms of Grace's writing, she was always looking for the conflict and um, listen it into being. These were the other two things that sort of struck me. What, what do those two things resonate with? How do they resonate with you for, in terms of film, the filmmaking process? Oh, that's it. I didn't think about the, well, I listened to, I listened to a lot of radio, uh, mm -hmm recordings of Grace, and then I put it all together. But yeah, that, w that was the first time that I paid attention to how I had to listen. So that's interesting. You, you ask a good question. Um, the, the rules came about in 
hearing Alan Gurganis and Esther Broner and Leora. I heard them all talk about how she taught. Mm -hmm. And so I grabbed that and um, then typed, had it in a typing out mode and it worked. Things worked, but I had a great team. I have to say that. I have, I have a co-producer who lives in LA and we're, we're on the phone and she was a TV person and I use her because she's really good on putting stories together. So th that's how we work together. I type it out, and then she's, I send it to her, and then, she come, and then it comes back. But, so I'm sure you know, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it is a process. And I did, there's one other person here I should have pointed out. There's Judith Arcana over there. Remember when I called you? in the middle of the night, and I didn't know her because she, she lives in Oregon, and, but I did know that she wrote the book about oh, wow. Grace Paley, so, and she was on a panel oh, this morning, and it was a wonderful panel, but I remember I called you, I was in a panic, wasn't I? <laughs> Some kind of panic, and, and you calmed me down, and then I went on. I, do you remember why I was panicked? <laughs> I remember the specific thing, but I remember that we had two long phone conversations. Oh, oh wait, the yeah. mic, the mic. Hammer, sorry. Mike, Mike, Mike. Right Judith here. Arcana, raise right your here. hand. <laughs> She's good. I remember that we had two long phone conversations and a bunch of email, I'm sure. And I loved those conversations because working with you was really working with you in that wonderful way. You know how it is when you're collaborating with somebody about anything, even when we disagreed. And I remember that I kept saying, well, it's your movie, Lily. But <laughs> when we disagreed, we did it in this wonderful high level. I'm serious. I'm not just praising us. Um, <laughs> I mean, I am praising us, but I'm not just praising us because we disagreed, actually even argued, in such a good way about grace and about the f making of the film. It was exciting arguing with you, Lily. <laughs> and it was a lot of fun doing heavy duty stuff mm -hmm. about the movie about Grace. So I remember the fact of the conversations, what? but I can't say I remember specific individual lines or yes. why that particular time. One thing, oh wait, here, suddenly the pop-up in the brain, um, there was the thing about was she a feminist, wasn't she a feminist? Oh, because yeah. Vivian yeah. has one view, and a lot of other people say other things, although Alice says a mitigating thing, it's pretty interesting. That's, that is a very good question, and I, that was another quote, actually, that I had written yeah. down as well. Or does anybody else want to respond to that in addition to Lily? Mm -hmm. Lily. Okay, well, that... I just want to say, no one knows, from what I can tell right now, what a feminist is. I mean, oh. I, it's oh. always open for discussion. Lenore, take no, I mean, I, I, I really wanted to respond to this um, because I, you know, some, I think it was Time Magazine had this, said the, the worst words that are ever mentioned, and one of them was feminism. Because nobody knows what this is, and I worked really closely with Grace, and there, it, just to have a she and a her was remarkable. I mean, I never thought that anything I thought as a girl was important. Mm. And that was her magic, the way she empowered people who really felt invisible, really invisible, and a lot of them were women. So I don't agree with what Vivian said at all. I mean, I think there are all different ways to be a feminist, you know, if anyone knows what one is. Well, I, I am sure that Vera and B don't agree uh, <laughs> with Vivian, and I'm, I'm sure that other people here don't agree, but I put it in the film, I know you understand this, is I want attention. Absolutely. There's I, a conflict. Conflict. There's a conflict, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I put it in, and every time I showed the film in the past, there would always be people who said, She's a feminist. How dare she say she isn't a feminist? But Vivian felt that she was not a feminist, you know, because she had a family and she was very caught up with her family. Well, feminists have families, and and uh, but I think Vivian probably would say even more. I think she just didn't think that Grace was a pure feminist, whatever that means. 
Well, I think that that's a, it's an ongoing conversation. Um, you know, there's this, this, this myth that you can't be a wife and a mother and also be a feminist, you know, that you can't be heterosexual and be a feminist, that you can't, you know, all of these things. Right. And that's, that's an ongoing, you know, conflict, I think, within the community that, you know, needs to be ironed out, needs to be voiced, and, um, you know, your film does an amazing job of presenting both sides of that, um, especially in terms of, of Grace as the, this traditional mother character that we envision. How, how could she possibly be found? It's easy. And she obviously was. Obviously. <laughs> obviously. I, I saw the hand of a man over there. That would be nice. Did you? We'd love to hear from yeah. men, yes. <laughs> Well, I was a close friend of Grace's, both in the uh, Greenwich Village Peace Center community and later at Sarah Lawrence. And I, can, I could say many wonderful things, but regarding feminism, she decidedly considered it in the late 70s, um, in mid-70s in particular, she, would, she viewed it as an encroachment upon the political movement she'd come to be a part of, the anti-war movement in particular, and she was not loath to call feminist bourgeoisie, and that tells you her um, passionate view about it. Indeed, I urged at a conference that we begin with some words of Barbara Deming, who was from the anti-war movement, a great interpreter of Gandhi, and then a feminist, a lesbian feminist indeed. And she thought that that was inappropriate because it was bourgeois feminism. <laughs> and um, I think as audi her audiences were anti-war and then they became more and more women, she toured the country. And as women became her audience, she accepted the um, context of feminism. And she does make a little elliptical allusion to this in the, her introduction to her collected short stories, if you read it carefully. She says something like, it just sort of happened. Mm -hmm. I may be wrong on the exact words, but in substance, she's, she points to it happening, this, her ideological acceptance of this and her part in that emerging movement. Mm -hmm. But then she says, as you, cause, because I put it in there, that the feminist movement was the most important movement that ever happened. So, um, well, but that's part of her evolution yes. of consciousness. Yes, yes, thank you. For, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments on this? Yes, yeah, I want to add. Wait, 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 we wait. have to get the mic to you. We have to get the One mic to you, Vera, because they oh, are recording. Here you go. The uh, Grace wrote most of, um, well, she wrote all of the unity statement that we used, and, and a lot of us learned it by heart, actually. It was the, the, those were the words that went with us to Washington for the Women's Pentagon Action. And we sat and recited it, as much of it as we could remember, we read it. Uh, it was very important to us. The way she wrote it is a very uh, uh, a valuable uh, understanding of her personality also, is that she wrote it over and over. Uh, not thinking of herself as the grand writer, but as uh, pieces came in from, all, it was largely an East Coast movement, but as uh, pieces came in from all over that people wanted in the unity statement, she incorporated them. But it kept this uh, marvelous unity of, st of uh, style. But the unity, sta and she did that several times, at least three, I think. Uh, the unity statement is a very feminist statement, particularly about war. In it is a sentence which, which I often think of now that we have so many women in the armed forces and, and what that all has led to. But there is something like, uh, uh, we, don't, we don't want to add ourselves to the wars. Uh, that that isn't like a gain to us. We would like our brothers equal to us in uh, not, not fighting the wars. But that's just one little thing. The whole way it's set forth uh, is from, uh, I'm not even gonna call them feminist, but is from, it includes all the many new insights and understandings and passionately life-saving uh, 
views we came to have through uh, both more ideological feminists, perhaps like Vivian, or more people interested in the theories, and, uh, and people who were protesters, and people who wanted to change their own particular lives. All of those things added up, and are still adding up, to our understanding of this, which, as Grace said, is one of the great world-changing movements. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so it can't be just one thing, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But but that was a, and and a, and and that is a wonderful statement, mm -hmm. the unity statement. I think you know, if it could have uh, much more circulation, it would come to be seen as a a very great piece of political writing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which does not knock anybody on the head mm -hmm. to be listened to. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's, it's but that's a great interesting piece. too that you bring that up here because there was another question I wanted to bring up to, to Lily. At the beginning of the film, Grace opens with a piece talking about the responsibility of a poet. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that in terms of you as the filmmaker, because I think I always ask filmmakers, what is our responsibility in terms of representation of ourselves, of women, of people of color, of other others that don't look like us, that don't sound like us, and that don't have their voices heard? What do you, how would you respond to that in terms of your filmmaking? Well, truth is the most important thing for me. I mean, uh, in a film that has not been seen very much, but it was the hardest film that, mm, this one is hard too. But, <laughs> but a difficult personal film I made was called uh, Give Me a Kiss about my parents. And uh, I remember, a sleepless night when I came to a very clear understanding that if I don't deal totally transparently and truthfully, I won't be able to tell the stories that I want to tell. So that, that's pretty important for me. Now, more than that, uh, let me see. Well, I, I think one of the things that often comes to mind is, you know, as um, artistic, creative people, do we have a responsibility to um, voice a particular political point of view or to advocate for a political, particular political point of view? I do. <laughs> uh, I, I make films from uh, progressive, even on that, what is progressive, uh, because I find that I don't agree on these days on some things um, that are coming from very left mm -hmm. positions. So I, I don't agree, and I don't make films from a very left position. But uh, I do make films from the point of view of a Jewish, feminist, progressive in the center, <laughs> person, and that is my framework. And then I begin to put the story together. And uh, then I work with the team. I have, as I said, a wonderful team, and the process is, first I work with an intern, or in this case, an assistant who's dying to meet you, so we'll do that okay. at, at some other point. Uh, and then I bring Pola in because she's very expensive and <laughs> she's my editor. And I'm always working with Margaret Murphy, who is in LA, and it's through email and telephone. And but the story is clear to me in the beginning. So uh, the story of Heather right now, I I'm I see a trilogy now that I've, and I didn't know it was a trilogy. So there's Grace, which is uh, activist, writer, is her art. Esther Broner, who was a writer, but I look at it from her creation of the feminist Seder. So that runs all the way through. And now Heather Booth, I'm one third through, 
But um, it is through Heather I will tell the history of the progressive movement in the last 50 years because she started out in Mississippi and she's an organizer, community organizer slash political organizer. And so the story will go. I haven't found the structure yet. Okay. Uh, I expect that the structure will come as I gather the material and the research. I think that's, that's the other part of the process, for sure. I mean, especially documentary making, you, you may not even know what the story is until you have enough footage to see mm -hmm. what's in front of you, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments from the audience? I never, I never, I never asked you this, and I'm just really curious. Why Grace Taylor's? <sighs> I mean, I know. I'm sorry. I would know why I would want to do Grace Pilly, but what was it about Grace and her life that Thank you. enraptured you so much that you just had to make a movie and do all that work? Because it sure was a lot of work. Well, I had, I was, I knew Grace because her friends were my friends. She used to come to the Feminist Seder, and so I got to know her there. And I kept thinking, uh, this woman, I must tell her story. And then Nesta Crane, Nesta Crane, what's Nesta's last name, please? King. King. Nesta C King lives in West Beth, and uh, I was still working on another film. I think, can you hear, yeah, can you hear me? Israeli and Palestinian women, women fight for peace, and she came by and said, you know, Grace is not well. That did it. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I have to start. But I always admired Grace, and I loved Grace. Who doesn't? I mean, and you can see that I loved her, but who, who does not love Grace? So. There are people who do not love Grace. Really? Yeah. Well, I don't know them. <laughs> All right, I'll say it again for the day. There are people who do not love Grace. When I was working on the book, I met some. <laughs> and, Oh, that's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, even people that you might like, unlike Norman Mailer, who you might not, <laughs> um, it happens in life. I was taken aback, let's put it that way, when people said some of the things they said to me. But I thought, OK, get a grip here. This is a person. She does a lot of heavy duty stuff. Some people don't like it or fill in the blank. You know, what are the other reasons that people don't like other people? Mm -hmm. right. So, and also, I'm not in favor of making her not a human being. Right. Mm -hmm. You know? One of the things that was so engaging, and still is, thanks to your movie and a lot of other stuff that still exists in the world, though she doesn't, uh, we know that uh, she was pretty complicated, and she was a person. You know, despite the question of the mother character, when will you be a person? <laughs> Indeed, she always was one. And what that means is that it ain't all perfect all the time, though she lived at a very high level of possible personhood, in my view. Hardly perfect, but um, somehow this line comes up that I, I always remember and I love it, which is where she says, uh, talking about the divorce, and, and she says, even if the sex is good, if the conversation is over, it's over. Yes. And I think that is the best advice <laughs> that anybody can get. If you can't have a conversation with your partner, it's over. <laughs> your partner's not your partner anymore. <laughs> or n no longer, right. <laughs> I think that was the, and I think that was her bit of advice to, to young women. She said, find the right guy. Right. <laughs> the right guy. Well, I don't know if we have any more questions, but I think I would love to um, sum this up so that we can mingle a little bit more in person. But Lily, I think this film is amazing, and I think we definitely have to work on getting it into, onto television and into more people's audiences so that people can really take advantage of this great work and, and um, see a part of our great history as well right. that we don't get to see too often. So great. thank you very much thank for your you wonderful work. Thank you, audience. Thank and we you. hope you'll, you'll join us for some refreshments. Thank you. <laughs>